in the last lecture we saw briefly the mechanism or the interaction which is basically responsible for ferromagnetic ordering in a magnetic solid. We said that this interaction is known as the exchange interaction and also indicated that to understand the how this exchange interaction works, it is necessary to consider the so called Heitler London model of a homonuclear diatomic molecule such as hydrogen. So, in this lecture we will consider this in greater detail. So, we will be discussing exchange interaction using the Heitler London model for covalent bonding of a homonuclear diatomic molecule such as hydrogen example. So, we already started on this, but today we will talk a little bit in greater detail on this. So, the figure shows the hydrogen molecule and uh, you have the two nuclei A and B are the atomic nuclei the, of the hydrogen atom which are represented by well these are the nuclei and then you have the electrons 1 and 2. The hydrogen has two atomic nuclei and two electrons. So, the nuclei are shown by the letters A and B and the electrons are indicated by the numbers 1 and 2. So, the various distances are this is R A 1, this is R B 2, this is R A 2, this is this is R A 2, this is R B 1, we also have R 1 2 and we have R A B. These are the various distances. So, in terms of these distances, we can write the Hamiltonian operator, the Hamiltonian operator will involve the individual kinetic energies of the two atoms P 1 square by 2 m plus P 2 square by 2 m, where m is the mass of the electron and uh, you can say 2 m 2, but this m 1 equal to m 2 equal to m e mass of electron the electrons are identical and have the same mass. Then you have E square by 4 pi epsilon naught into 1 by R 1 2 plus 1 by R A B. This is the repulsive energy, potential energy 
of the two electrons and this is the repulsive potential energy of the two atomic nuclei. So, this is a total repulsive potential energy term. Then you have binding or attractive terms, potential energy terms due to the various interactions R A 1, R B 2 plus 1 by R A 2 plus 1 by R B 1. These are the four interactions terms which constitute attractive potential energy terms. So, that is the total Hamiltonian of the two electron hydrogen molecule. So, this is the Hamiltonian and we have to use the corresponding two electron wave functions which are of the form psi 1 2 equals 1 over root 2 which is a normalization constant times psi a 1 psi b 2 plus or minus psi a 2 psi b 1. So, that is the two electron wave function which involves the product wave functions of the single electron wave functions of the form psi a 1 and psi b 2 which means electron 1 is with the nucleus of the atom a and the electron 2 is with the nucleus b and but it is also equally probable that the electron 2 spends time with the nucleus a while the electron 1 spends time with the nucleus b. So, both are equally probable and therefore, we put a linear combination of these two product wave functions. This linear combination can be symmetric or anti symmetric with respect to exchange of the electrons and therefore, the plus sign corresponds to the symmetric linear combination and the minus sign corresponds to an anti symmetric linear combination. Both will give rise to the same modulus square of the wave function and therefore, are equally probable. So, we have to consider both possibilities and this is the wave function which has to be combined with this in the solution of the Schrodinger equation of the form H psi equal to E psi where E is the energy eigenvalue. So, we have to determine the energy eigenvalues of the homonuclear diatomic molecule which has a Hamiltonian of this form and a wave function of this form. So, if we solve this problem and find the energy eigenvalues, we will have a clue to see which are the ground state energies, what is the ground state energy, which are the energetically favored states of the molecule. So, this is the key to the entire question. So, when this is done, we see that if I have only the first part that is the we already know p 1 square by 2 m 1 minus e square by 4 pi epsilon naught r a 1. This is the potential energy term and this is the kinetic energy term of the hydrogen atom 1. Similarly, p 2 square by 2 m 2 with a minus e square by 4 pi epsilon naught 1 by r b 2 gives you the kinetic and potential energy terms of the Hamiltonian of the individual hydrogen atom 2. So, this gives you the total energy this these two plus these two give you the energy Hamiltonian unperturbed terms of the Hamiltonian which correspond to the total of which gives you the total energy of two unperturbed hydrogen atoms. So, the remaining terms are perturbations. So, this one is a perturbation and similarly these two terms are perturbations. These are extra terms. So, the perturbing Hamiltonian 
is of the form minus e square by 4 pi epsilon naught times 1 by R A 2 plus 1 by R B 1 plus e square by 4 pi epsilon naught into 1 by R 1 2 is the inter electron repulsion plus 1 by R A B which is the inter nuclear repulsion. So, these are the terms. So, the original unperturbed Hamiltonian has gives you the total energy the sum of the individual energies of the two isolated hydrogen atoms in their ground states. And, but this these extra terms in the unperturbing Hamiltonian modify this energy of the two electron eigenfunction and these energy eigenvalues in the presence of the perturbation are found by solving the secular determinant according to perturbation theory which has the form h 1 1 prime minus e h 1 2 prime h 2 1 prime h 2 2 prime minus e equal to 0 that is known as the secular determinant. Here H 1 1 prime is the so called matrix element, matrix element of the perturbing Hamiltonian H prime with between the state psi 1 and psi 1. So, we have similarly H 1 2 prime is the matrix element between the states psi 1 and psi 2 and so on. So, solving this leads to a quadratic equation expanding the determinant and recognizing that H 1 1 prime and H 2 2 prime are the same. Similarly, H 1 2 prime equal to H 2 1 prime knowing this we have a quadratic of the form which will give you you have a quadratic by expanding the determinant and the roots of this quadratic or give you the energy eigenvalues. So, this is going to be H 1 1 prime plus or minus H 1 2. Now, this is based on the assumption that the overlap integral of the form integral psi 1 star psi 2 d tau is 1 if this is s equal to is taken as 1. Under that assumption, these are the energy eigenvalues. So, having solved the secular determinant, we have got the matrix elements and what is the meaning of this H 1 1 prime is the usual integral. So, you have two possibilities this is usually known as the Coulomb integral. So, this is the form psi 1 H prime psi 1. So, that is the usual form of the Coulomb integral where the H prime has these electrostatic terms and this is the so called exchange integral which is the form psi 1 H prime psi 2. This has this term has no classical analog this means that you have the this is the matrix element of the perturbing Hamiltonian which is of a purely electrostatic character between a quantum mechanical state and this wave function corresponding to the state in which this wave function the electrons 
or interchange. So, this is therefore, it is known as the exchange integral. This is a purely quantum mechanical effect which has no classical analog and this exchange force is of purely electrostatic origin because the perturbing Hamiltonian H prime it consists of only electrostatic attractive and repulsive terms. So, the this gives you the sum total and therefore, the net energy eigenvalue there are two possibilities corresponding to the Coulomb integral plus the exchange integral and the Coulomb integral minus the exchange integral. So, you have the two possibilities. So, more often these are referred to as C plus or minus j, where j is the exchange integral and C is the Coulomb integral. So, now as a result of this, the originally degenerate energy eigenstates are the unperturbed hydrogen atoms. This degeneracy is lifted and you have now two states, one with the energy C plus j and C minus j according to this, the state C minus j lies lower than this stressed with C plus j if j is positive. If j is negative, then C plus j will lie lower than the C minus j term. So, which is the state which lies lower depends on the sign of the exchange integral. The exchange integral can be positive or negative and the C minus j state correspond to an anti-symmetric linear combination of the two electron spatial wave functions. Now, this is a very interesting situation. What does it mean? It is this corresponds to and let us write this. So, let us consider the situation corresponding to a positive exchange integral in greater detail. If what does it mean? This means that the state C minus j with energy C minus j lies lower than the state C plus j. This corresponds to an anti symmetric linear combination of the spatial part of the wave function. Now, what does this mean? Now, the total wave function however, consists of not only the spatial part, but also the total wave function of the system is a product of the spatial and the spin part of the wave function. And according to Pauli exclusion principle, this total wave function should be anti symmetric with respect to exchange in order to satisfy the Pauli exclusion principle. And now we know that this is a, this spatial part is anti symmetric. So, in order that the product of these two spatial and spin parts should be anti symmetric, this means that it should be symmetric with respect to exchange of spin. So, let us see under what conditions the spin part of the wave function will be symmetric. So, let us look at the spins in some detail. 
we know that the electron spin is half and therefore, you have two possibilities of the magnetic quantum number which shows the orientation of the electron spin with respect to an external magnetic field. So, if this orientation is parallel to the external field, we show it by an up arrow and if the two spins are both parallel, then that is going to give you a spin state corresponding to the total spin which is half plus half which is 1 and that is obviously a state which is symmetric with respect to exchange. So, this will also have you can also have the possibility in which both the spins are anti parallel. If this is so, this is this corresponds to m s equal to minus 1, but this is still corresponds to s equal to 1. So, corresponding to s equal to 1, you have two possibilities now m s equal to 1 and m s equal to minus 1, you also have the possibility m s equal to 0 and that is a state of this kind. with a normalization. So, this corresponds to m s equal to 0, it is a symmetric linear combination of the states with an up arrow and down arrow and a down arrow and an up arrow. So, all these three states together correspond to give rise to a spin 1 and therefore, there are three states. So, this is called a triplet state. So, the one which is left out which corresponds to an anti symmetric linear combination of the spins, this is anti symmetric with respect to spin. So, this corresponds to s equal to 0, m s equal to 0 and this is an anti symmetric singlet state. So, it is these three states which are symmetric which go into this. So, this corresponds to ferromagnetic ordering. So, j greater than 0 corresponds to a ferromagnetic ground state. Whereas, the anti symmetric spin configuration corresponding to a singlet state with s equal to 0 corresponds to a symmetric linear combination of the spatial part and that corresponds to an anti ferromagnetic state. So, this is state c plus j is an excited state in which the two spins are anti parallel. This is in case j is greater than 0. If j is negative on the other hand, then the state c plus j with anti parallel spins lies energetically lower than the state c minus j. So, you will have an anti ferromagnetic ground state in this case. So, this is the basic cause of the ferromagnetic or anti ferromagnetic ordering and therefore, it is the sign of the exchange integral j which determines whether a given material magnetic material will be ferromagnetic or anti ferromagnetic. This exchange integral is happens to be positive in the case of atoms like iron, cobalt and nickel and that is the reason why iron, cobalt and nickel or prototype ferromagnets. Now, this 
is the basic clue to the understanding of why the exchange interaction leads to ferromagnetic or anti ferromagnetic ordering. But we would like to write the exchange Hamiltonian in a form in which the spin operators are involved, so that the essential details of this energy level scheme are brought out by a spin Hamiltonian involving only the spin operators. involving only the spin operators. It should be we want to replace the actual Hamiltonian of the electron two electron system by a spin Hamiltonian involving only the spin operators such that it models the essential details of this two electron problem that is you have a ferromagnetic ground state which is triplet lying below the anti ferromagnetic excited singular state by an amount equal to 2 j because see the difference in energy is c minus j and c plus j is 2 j. So, you want to write a model Hamiltonian this was first proposed by Dirac. So, it is known as the Dirac Heisenberg. No, it was proposed by Heisenberg, so it is known as the Dirac Heisenberg Hamiltonian. It has the form minus two j s one dot s two. Now, let us see how this leads to the same situation and how such a Hamiltonian will model our system. We know that S square which is S 1 square plus S 2 square plus 2 S 1 dot S 2. So, we have S 1 dot S 2 is S square minus S 1 square minus S 2 square by 2. And in terms of the expectation values this is S into S plus 1 minus S 1 into S 1 plus 1 minus S 2 into S 2 plus 1 by 2. So, we have the possibility S equal to 1 for a triplet ground state. So, S 1 is half and S 2 is also half. So, for this S 1 dot S 2 will have the value 1 into 2 minus half into 3 by 2 minus half into 3 by 2 by 2 and that is 3 fourth 3 fourth so this is 3 by 2. So, this will give me 1 fourth. Whereas, in the case of the singlet with total spin s equal to 0 for this this is the energy of the trip for s equal to 0 s 1 dot s 2 is going to be 0 minus 3 by 4 minus 3 by 4 by 2 which is minus 3 by 4. So, coming to the Heisenberg Hamiltonian it is minus 2 j into 1 fourth which is minus j by 2 for triplet. and this is equal to minus 2 j into minus 3 by 4 which is 3 j by 2 for the singlet. 
So, one sees that the energy difference delta E between the two is 3 j by 2. So, it is just 2 j. So, you have modeled the system as we wished. So, the Dirac Heisenberg exchange interaction Hamiltonian models our real ferromagnetic ground state. So, we use this instead of the original Coulomb and exchange actual Hamiltonian terms, it is this spin Hamiltonian which will be used in order to model the ground state of a real ferromagnetic material. A real ferromagnetic material actually contains a large number capital N of spins. So, it is the long range magnetic ordering of all these n spins which gives rise to the ferromagnet. So, in a system of such n spins, if I have n a total of n spins where n is very large, then we can write the total Hamiltonian as minus 2 j s 1 s i dot sigma s j, where the summation is over j, over all the n spins. So, that is the total Hamiltonian of this system. So, this can also be written as minus 2 j z n s i dot average s j, where this is the number of spins and z is the number of near neighbors. So, we assume that the exchange coupling is non-zero only between adjacent spins. So, the summation extends over these neighbors. So, z is the coordination number. which gives you the number of spins surrounding a given spin near neighbors. And the spin S j is the average. So, n is the total number of spins. So, this can be thought of as a mean field B m f acting on this spin. And this the strength of this mean field the average. It is called mean field because it is a statistical average. So, it is just 2 z j n s j by g j mu b. So, if we define the magnetic field of strength given by this then this is the mean magnetic field acting on this spin. So, you have this is equal to lambda m in our original Weiss molecular field picture. So, this magnetization is lambda g j mu b s j. Therefore, we compare these two and get. So, in terms of the exchange interaction constant j and the number of atoms or spins and the number of spin co the coordination number, we get an expression for the Weiss molecular field. So, we are in a position to relate the Dirac Heisenberg exchange spin Hamiltonian formalism and the mean field hypothesis enable us to obtain an expression for the relation between the Weiss molecular field constant lambda and the exchange integral j. So, we now have a microscopic understanding of the cause of the ferromagnetic or anti ferromagnetic ordering in terms of the so called exchange interaction which is a purely quantum mechanical 
interaction based on the electrostatic interactions of the electrons. Now, this is a direct exchange. We can also have exchange interaction between ions which are far away, which are not next to each other as in a homonuclear diatomic molecule, but which are very far away, but then the exchange interaction is mediated by things which are between these two far away spins. What are these things? These can be conduction electrons. This is the case in the case of rare earth metals. The conduction electrons can mediate, in other words, the spin of one ion can interact with an electron as a conduction electron, which is free to wander around and that conduction electron in turn interacts with the other ion. So, there is effect in effect an exchange coupling between the two ions mediated by the conduction electrons. This is what happens in the case of the rare earth metals. In the case of transition metals, you have metal compounds containing say oxygen atoms, transition metal oxides like manganese oxide for example. You have the mediation between the two ions, the exchange interaction is caused by intervening oxygen ions. So, one ion the spin interacts with the neighboring oxygen ions, oxygen spin and this oxygen spin in turn interacts with the other ion. So, you have uh, an exchange interaction between the two transition metal ions mediated by the intervening oxygen spins of the oxygen ions. So, this is known as the super exchange. The conduction electron mediated exchange interaction was first proposed by these people Ruderman, Kittel, Kasuya and Yoshida. So, this is known as R K K Y interaction. So, the conduction electron mediated exchange interaction is known as the R k k y interaction and that is responsible for the ordering of rare earth metals. Whereas, the exchange mediated by oxygen ions in transition metal oxides is known as the super exchange. So, we have direct exchange super exchange and then R k k y interaction. So, these are the different kinds of exchange interaction. There is another interesting family known as the rare earth manganites in which there is a special form of exchange interaction known as double exchange. In the manganese, there are manganese ions. So, you have a manganese 2 plus and a manganese 3 plus ions separated by an oxygen ion. So, the exchange involves the simultaneous hopping of an electron from adjacent manganese and ion oxygen ions into neighboring sites in the crystal lattice. So, that an Mn 2 plus becomes an Mn 3 plus and the Mn 3 plus becomes an Mn 2 plus. So, there is a double exchange mechanism, there is a simultaneous hopping of an electron. So, this is known as the double exchange mechanism. So, these are the various forms of exchange interactions. Now, the molecular field model can also be used to describe the behavior of anti ferromagnets for which as we have already seen the ground state is that of a anti parallel spins which are aligned anti parallel to each other. So, the entire structure can be thought of 
as consisting of two interpenetrating sub lattices in which the spins are oppositely aligned. So, you can have a picture in which there are interpenetrating sub lattices. So, you have a two sub lattice model for example, of an anti ferromagnetic solid. So, the molecular field hypothesis enables us to write the interactions in the presence of an applied magnetic field as follows. So, you have the possibility to write the magnetization in the first sub lattice is given by the Curie constant times B minus lambda m right lambda m 2 this is the applied field. So, this is the total this is the C 1 B by 2 T the factor 2 comes because you have an half the sub the lattice is divided into 2 there are 2 interpenetrating sub lattices the Curie constant therefore, gets to the form C 1 by 2. No, this will be the local field. Similarly, we can write a similar equation for the other sub lattice where T is the temperature. So, solving these two equations simultaneously, we will get the total Curie constant and the magnetizations of the two sub lattices. Solving these two together, we find that for an anti ferromagnet which is in the paramagnetic phase that is above the Curie temperature, the magnetic susceptibility follows a Curie wise behavior, but with the magnetic total magnetization is of the form a Curie wise behavior, but with a positive sign for the C by T plus theta. We may recall that for a ferromagnet it was in the form T minus theta. This is if we can write the susceptibility in the paramagnetic state. So, this is the ferromagnet this is the behavior of the susceptibility for an anti ferromagnet. So, if we plot the susceptibility temperature dependence of this inverse susceptibility as before, then we get we saw the already that chi inverse versus T is something like this for a ferromagnet. With this as the paramagnetic Curie temperature, whereas for an anti ferromagnet. So, this is 0. So, we have a negative intercept this is theta. So, this is the behavior of an anti ferromagnet above the ordering or Curie temperature or the Curie wise temperature theta. So, we can easily distinguish between the behavior of a ferromagnetic material and an anti ferromagnetic material even by measuring the paramagnetic susceptibility above the Curie wise temperature. So, you will have a negative intercept in the case of an anti ferromagnet whereas, it will have a positive intercept for a ferromagnet. The temperature determined from an extrapolation of the high temperature susceptibility that is this theta need not coincide with the temperature at which a spontaneous magnetization appears in the two sub lattices. See we must understand that there is this is the Curie wise temperature which is measured by measuring the inverse susceptibility and plotting it as a function of temperature in the paramagnetic state. But the actual ordering temperature, the critical temperature, the magnetic ordering temperature is the one in which 
a spontaneous magnetization appears in the two sub lattices. If there is a spontaneous magnetization and since in the antiferromagnet the spins are aligned anti parallel to each other, the two sub lattices have equal but opposite signs for the spontaneous magnetization. Therefore, the total magnetization is 0 even though the individual sub lattice magnetizations are non zero because these two sub lattice magnetizations are equal in magnitude but opposite in direction so the temperature at which such a thing happens the temperature at which spontaneous sub lattice magnetization appears is known as the nil temperature T n in general T n is not equal to theta even in magnitude. So, the nil temperature is the actual temperature of the ordering, but then how do you detect anti ferromagnetic ordering? If you measure the total magnetization it is 0 as in the paramagnetic state. So, you have to really look at the sub lattice ordering there is no way in which you can measure the magnetization in the sub lattice. So, in order to determine the nil temperature and actually observe the magnetic ordering in the two sub lattices in an antiferromagnet, the best way is to employ neutron diffraction. Neutrons have a magnetic moment, so they can interact with the spins and be diffracted. So, the diffraction intensities are determined by the ordering of the spins which can be different from the atomic or molecular ordering. So, this is what we will see for example, in a magnetically or anti ferromagnetically ordered solid like manganese oxide. We will look at this in detail in the next lecture.